So I want to start by thanking, first of all, Dr. Bassam Farjo came from Manchester because he's taken his time from his personal life to come over and, and work with me. And I, he is an amazing master at what he does. And it's fantastic that he can be here to, to co-lead this with me, both from the academic perspective as well as the uh, hands-on. And I really believe tomorrow the hands-on is going to be vital to understand this. You probably saw that I gave some lectures on fat grafting. And until you put your hands on a, on a cadaver onto a patient, you really don't conceptualize it. And that's why in the St. Louis course, I really feel it's a big part of it is to, to, to do, do the work and get hands-on. The first part of this talk is really going to be understanding hair loss. Because without understanding hair loss in its larger frame of focus, you can't be a good surgeon. You have to understand the medical side of things as well. So when I was in San Diego a couple years ago, I was talking to a, a facial plastic surgeon colleague of mine sitting next to me. Um, and he said, you know, I can spot a, a bad hair transplant a mile away. I said, well, the guy in front of you had his crown done, and the gentleman next to you has a toupee on. And he says, I can't see that. I said, because you don't understand patterns of hair loss. So this, photo, this drawing is in all the basic books. And I encourage you to memorize it, look at it, understand it, and start to look at people's hair loss patterns. Because until you understand what is na a natural hair loss pattern, you can't design it. So understand natural male pattern hair loss. So to start from the beginning, this is maybe a too basic a slide for some, but it's fundamental to understand this. This is how modern hair restoration works. Norman Orntreich in the 50s found that hair that's genetically programmed not to be lost, which is in the back of the head, OK? So you think of the baldest gentleman you know. He still has a strip of hair here, unless he shaves it, but he still has hair there. You move that hair to the front of the head, and it's, for the most part, given a few small exceptions, should not be lost. So that's a great thing, and it's a bad thing. That's called donor dominance. It means that the donor it retains the characteristics no matter where you put it on the scalp. It's great because that guy has a lasting result. It's bad because if the progression progresses beyond where you have a donor capacity, then you're in trouble, which is what the next slide shows, which is the idea that you're fighting constantly. You're constantly having dwindling supply. In other words, the donor supply could be lost down a little bit, or you could be taking it for your surgery. And either way, your supply is diminishing. And over time, your demand is increasing because you're getting balder and balder. So when you're having this fighting struggle of increasing demand and diminishing supply, you have to mentally project forward in time. 15, 20 years of how much loss that is happening for him so you don't run out of hair. So this is why the younger patient is the greatest dilemma in hair transplant. You have a 20-year-old guy that wants to have the lowest hairline as possible because all his friends don't have a high hairline. And you're going to run out of hair in that guy. So when you're dealing with a teenager, mid to early, early to mid-20s, even late 20s, if you've got a guy rapidly losing hair, you can have a problem down the road. And also, today's style is perhaps a shaved head if you're dealing with someone that's younger. You know, someone in their mid-50s, they may want an isolated um, forelock, which is up here, because they're not used to shaving their head. But someone 30 is used to shaving his head. And if you condemn him to a little patch there, it may not look good for him. So that's something you always have to do as a surgeon here, is project forward. Project forward in time to see if you have enough hair. This slide is a basic slide. What it basically means is we have it, male pattern baldness is not a shedding uh, issue. It's not that you all of a sudden have no hair. It, it is a, like a chemical equation where you go from thick terminal hairs to things called vellus or miniaturized hairs, which are these thin, shorter, flimsier, see-through hairs, the wispy hairs that then go to no hairs. Okay, so. The key with this is if you're at that stage right here with the vellus hairs, you still can save them medically. So don't just look at this as a surgeon, because oftentimes when we're surgeons, all we think about is cutting. That's fantastic, but you've got to remember this, this lecture is not about cutting. It's about saving this hair before it becomes unretrievable. So you want these vellus hairs are very amenable, very treatable with medicine. And what are those medicines? I'm going to briefly introduce them. And Bassam is going to talk about more in depth. So we can bring them back here. Think of it like a chemical equation. They're not going to all come back here. Some will come back here. These will slow down and not go as far to here. These will slow down and go to there. But the net, hopefully, you'll slow the progression down. That's the goal of medical management. And it's a fundamental element to helping uh, 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 in terms of a strategy. 
So the two basic ones that are FDA clear in the United States, I can't speak for the rest of the world, are finasteride, which is an oral medication marketed as Propecia, and minoxidil, which has been marketed as Rogaine or Regain in various parts of the world, and that's a topical application. And a lot of people wonder, do I need both? And these are synergistic. It's like playing a piano with two hands. They work together. And they've shown that if you take finasteride for a certain number of years and you add minoxidil, you get a, sometimes a bump in improvement. If you take both and you stop one, you get a little loss. So together, they're synergistic. And they all can help a patient. But today, we have even more things. We've got PRP injections which can help. And I'm going to have a, discuss, I'll have a talk about that in about an hour. And that can help build hair. It, it's unclear exactly how long, but that can help. And then laser technologies. There's, in the past, you would have to go into office. And now you have these devices that you can either comb through the hair, wear a cap on your head, and not have to necessarily go into an office. So you've got laser technology. And does that work? Yes, there have been now a lot of multi-center um, placebo or sham device randomized control studies that show that it actually works. And, and clinically, I've seen very good results with lasers. So I really, it took me a while to believe that they worked. I absolutely agree. I absolutely believe they work. And that's something that is around there uh, we have now. And then don't forget, we have other devices. We have camouflaging products that can make hair look thicker. Let's say the patient is undergoing a lot of shedding, and you, you just need to be helped out. And you may think, what can we do? You can help with, I'm not going to get into too much detail, but you can, you can put some powder there and camouflage it. And that may be enough. And that can maybe give a 23-year-old hope when all they think is, is surgery is the answer. That may be able to be a $40 solution. And that's something to think about. So be comprehensive in your evaluation with a patient. Don't just think like a surgeon. And so the other thing that's really important is to treat the head with respect in terms of all the, the, the details of it. So un understand the anatomy. Because hair grows differently in each of the regions of the scalp. And so this, I'm not going to go through lateral humps and mid scalps and vertex, but the hair grows differently. And so this is just a drawing to show you how hairs grow differently. And why is that important? Because you can make hairs, I suggested this in my talk on Friday, you can make hairs look fake because you don't grow them the right, you don't put them in the right angles. But also, this is what makes hair fun. This is what makes hair not what we think traditionally where it's boring. OK? I think I've got 45 mics. Anyone have another mic for me? Um, but it's, it, it, you know, what really, it is fun. And that's the thing I want to encourage you is that a lot of times you think rhinoplasty is creative and hair transplant is boring. I thought that when I started. But now I, I actually love doing my work. I don't sit there going, oh my god, how many hours I got left in this doing this procedure. I actually really, really love making. I, I look at that and I get excited, and then, and then I go draw a pattern. So you know, you can create designs. These are just you know designs of different hairlines. They're fun. You know, I don't get bored making this. These are just different angles that you can do to make fun sites as a crown. You know, you can make different patterns that are fun. Um, and this is a female hairline. This is just to show you that it's. This is like. You know, looking at a, a custom made student, be able to do, make little patterns. And then a, after every um, procedure, just like you know, the Gunter diagrams you saw uh, Norm Bessor give with, with the nose to show you what he did, I record everything in my electronic me medical record with how, how many graphs I put in, wh which sites, what sizes, how did I design it, what kind of angles did I use. I record all that. And so when the patient comes back, I can say, OK, that worked. I, this didn't work as well. I could get better here. But I've got a, a, a record of it. And it, it helps me get feedback from my own work. And it's, it's a good document. I, I came up with this little idea in uh, my book, the first edition of uh, my first volume, which is just understanding the head. To, to understand the topography of the head is a box. Because clearly, it's not a box. Well, some of ours maybe. Maybe, maybe mine is. But the idea is that. If you think of vertical planes, horizontal planes, and transitional planes, that's a good, easy way to think about how the hair head is structured. So in other words, the hairline is a transition from horizontal plane to vertical plane. And we'll talk about that more as we get to the, uh, another talk, talk in a second. But I just want to introduce that concept. So going from horizontal to vertical is from hairline to temple. Okay? Going from horizontal to vertical is going from mid-scalp to crown. Okay, so if you think of these things that in a, that way, you can start to understand the topography. And when you understand the topography, you can design. And then these are just understanding when you're making the recipient sites, which are where the little holes that the graphs go into. That angle is so important. So angle refers to the anterior-posterior position of the site, and direction refers to going this way. Don't worry about tilt or anything else. But I'm just telling you how you make those sites 
will dictate how the result is going to be. And tomorrow we're going to make some recipient sites and we'll look at density patterns and all those kind of things. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I think you're going to see how much fun it can be to do hair. And so going back to the slide again, think of understanding how hair grows differently on the scalp is fundamental. So the summary of this talk is as a surgeon, and most of you are a surgeon, you're signed up for a surgical uh, course. I'm not talking to dermatologists most likely, I'm talking to surgeons out there. Don't think like a surgeon. For a, for a moment, think like an internist because you must embrace and understand the fundamental progression of hair because of that supply and demand issue. Those, and you need to tr understand it from a medical perspective. So you can help the patient both medically and surgically and provide a comprehensive care. The, the final slide I always end with is think of yourself artistically. This, is, this can be as artistic and as fun as anything else you do in the world of facial work. And invite you to Paul Lumpur. I cannot be, be there personally because of a, a date change, which upsets me, but I, I cannot be there by October 8th, 11th. And come to St. Louis if you can, 23rd through 26th October. And with that, I'll introduce Bassam for the medical management because that's going to be the next most logical topic to continue.